<clears throat> the relevancy and the relativity of time. That time is relevant, of enormous impact, is beyond debate. Often time dictates when we eat, sleep, work, and play. Many of us are very dependent on our clocks and watches and time shown on cell phones to get us through the day. On the other hand, time is also relative, depending on one's perspective and situation in life. There are those who seem to have too much time on their hands, and the moments of each day pass at a snail's pace. The lonely, the isolated, the imprisoned, the fearful, the invalid and infirm, the depressed. By contrast, there are those who believe they have all the time in the world, time to, to pursue their dreams, to raise their families, to build their nest eggs, and sadly, all the time in the world to order their spiritual lives. Maybe you've heard someone say that people seem to be more involved in worship and Bible study later in life when they have more time. Unfortunately, this is often true. People wait until something in their aging life causes them to recognize the need for God's Word. But this idea of having more time is also wrong. We all have the same amount of time each day, each week, each year. The patterns and priorities we set for ourselves for the way we use our time in the prime of our life usually provide a template for how we spend our time later in life. Most of us find time for whatever is important to us, whatever we consider of value. Somewhere between those who have too much time and those who believe they have all the time in the world are those who think they have no time, those who are pulled in many different directions, each of which requires time, vocation, their life's work, leisure, marriage, family, church. These, with hectic and hurried lives, can find special comfort in the psalmist's words, the Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Psalm 121, verse 8. Especially when we find ourselves coming and going, and not knowing where or how or when to focus our priorities, we need to know that the Lord is watching over us. This is why, in these last hours of 2023, we take time to place our time into the timetable of our timeless God. The eternal God into, enters into time. Our text is Galatians 4, verses 4 through 7. But when the time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of sons. Because you are sons, God sent the Spirit of His Son into our hearts, the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. When the time had fully come, with God, nothing is haphazard or happenstance. God has a time for everything, and everything God plans happens on time, the exactly right time, especially for God's plan for our redemption. So it was that about 2,000 years ago, God knew that it was time, the exactly right time, the fullness of time, for the Savior to be born, a timeless God entering a time-driven world. Why then? Why not years earlier? Why didn't God send the Savior to deliver his chosen people from Egyptian oppression? Because, perhaps, one and a half millennia later, when the Savior did come, God's people were under a more serious form of slavery, one with eternal consequences. They had become subject to the expectations and exploitations of religious leaders like the Pharisees. They praised themselves as leading examples of the faith. They deluded others into believing that their self-serving piety pleased God. Their religion came, became synonymous with rituals and rites and rigid rules and regulations. There is no greater bondage of our will and spirit than seeking to satisfy God by ourselves. There is no greater spiritual enslavement 
than to believe that we are in charge of our eternal destiny. If, even for a split second, we believe that our relationship with the Lord and the fate of our salvation is dependent on the type of person we are, what kind of father or mother, husband or wife, pastor or plumber, how good or effective or productive or kind, we would be more oppressed than the lowliest, most subservient slave. That's why the Father sent the Son into the world in the fullness of time, namely to redeem us from the curse and burden of the law and place it squarely on the shoulders of Jesus. He, born of a woman, fully human and fully divine, was also born under the law. He kept the law perfectly, not the superficial mandates penned by the Pharisees, but the letter and the spirit of God's holy, piercing, and penetrating law. It is impossible for us to keep the law. We can't even get past the first commandment, you shall have no other gods, let alone the other nine, without saying, mea culpa, I am guilty. Christ's keeping of the law is a necessary part of his act of salvation. Even that perfect life was not sufficient to meet the criteria established by God for our salvation. The only son of the father also had to pay the price of sin's consequences. And so he did on the cross of Calvary, taking our sins upon himself, literally and spiritually dying our death. As we know and believe and confess, our sin and his death could not hold him as a slave in bondage. Easter, resurrection, new life. And through Christ's holy life, sacrificial death, and powerful resurrection, we are called sons and daughters of the Almighty God. We have been given the incredible invitation to call the God who created time itself, Abba, Father. In our terms, something like Daddy or Papa. For if we are God's children, then we also are God's heirs inheritors of life forever in heaven. This message is simple and straightforward law and gospel, sin and grace, bondage and freedom. It is relevant for all generations, for all years, for all time. It transforms the temporal into the eternal. It puts into heavenly perspective everything which, with which we concern ourselves during this brief time that we are citizens on earth. There is no more appropriate way to conclude one year and invite a new one than with the assurance that we are God's children, beloved of the Father. He the source, the ending he. This sermon's theme is a line from a hymn normally sung during the Christmas season, yet appropriately for all seasons. It takes our speck of life here on earth and places it within the framework of the unimaginable, incomprehensible expanse of God. Of the Father's love begotten, ere the worlds began to be, He is Alpha and Omega, He the source, the ending He. Of the things that are, that have been, and that future you shall see, evermore and evermore. He, the source, the ending he. Ending here means completion, perfection, fulfillment. He, the source, and the fulfillment of life itself. Christ our Lord has been with us since before we were born and shall be with us when our time on this earth comes to an end. And for certain, Christ is with us now at year's end and new year's beginning. Actually, there is no ending for our lives, for remember, we inherit eternity. Yet as we reflect and ponder the year now ending and past decades, even on all our life, we see the hand of God upon us. Can we dare enter a new year without an ever deepening relationship with the eternal Christ? He, the source, the ending he, of love itself. There is no greater love than that which the Father gives us through his Son. There is no greater love than that which receives us and welcomes us, not on our own terms, but through God's grace and mercy. That we are the children of God and may call upon God 
in the most endearing of terms, Abba, Father, is not what we merit, but is a profound demonstration of God's love. He, the source, the ending he, of what is, what has been, and what will be, evermore and evermore. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.